this is the first time that you know we've done it, done it since last year, and things ended on such a rough note with um, my personal behavior. It'll never happen again. It'll never happen again. Right? No. no. Okay. Oh, they can't collect their having a baby. You guys did get. Oh, it's close. Uh-oh. It's close. And, 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 oh, sorry. Oh, I didn't throw any sandwiches. That was somebody else. It's been a little while. It's been. But I'm happy to be back in this exciting new year to make some new videos. 2024 is the year of four, and it makes me think of great movies like Superman The Quest for Peace, Shrek Forever After, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, or Jaws The Revenge. Among beloved franchises, there's a long history of the fourth entry being the absolute best of the bunch. Well, luckily, next up in my series of on-cinema Oscar special retrospectives, the fourth entry is no exception. You may know it as the one where Mark impersonates all your favorites, like Grouchy and Goofball Marks. Grouchy... Groucho. Homo. Grouchy. Goofball marks. The one that made Greg Turkington break harder than he ever has in the history of the show. Hour, 42 minutes. <laughs> I gotta say, this is a funny movie. Let's keep our eye on how many of those we do. Or the one where whatever this is happens. If you've watched almost anything on my channel, you know I hold up on cinema as the greatest comedic project ever. It's so massive and it only gets richer and more rewarding the more you dig into it. The further fleshed out this world and these characters are, the deeper the humor goes. The individual components such as the Oscar specials naturally become more nuanced and layered. And with it comes some really surprising, shocking, and even powerful moments. Now, if you've seen the special, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm referring to. It's such a fascinating and unforgettable moment in the show's history that I feel I have to address it right away. And if we even have time, I'll probably get to the rest of it afterwards. Of course, I'm referring to the shifting power structure of the Chaplin's company. To take it back briefly, the previous Oscar special was catered by Chaplin's Chili. Joe's Chili. Mm. Chaplin's Chili. Chaplin's Chili. Joe's Chili is be something that Joe and I could talk about later. Joe's Chili. Chaplin's, Thank Chaplin's Chili. Chaplin's Chili was founded by Tom Chaplin, who described his business as one of the most popular restaurants on the West Side for a long time. The restaurant was alleged to be a mainstay of North Hollywood cuisine and was even a five-time silver award winner at the Inland Empire Cook-Off. During the third annual Oscar special, their chili boy Hank was on site to dish out that spicy slop all night. Though it gave Tim Heidecker diarrhea, he claimed it to be the best chili he'd ever had. Thank you to Charlie's Chili for their best chili I've ever had. And Chaplin secured the gig to cater the fourth annual. But in the year following, trouble was brewing faster than a pot of three bean, three alarm chowder. You see, Hank Friedman explains that a company called Levinson's Acquisitions Group actually bought out Chaplin's Chili and sought to expand the menu and scale the business. Unfortunately, this didn't sit right with Tom Chaplin, who decided to part ways with the company, taking the rights to the name Chaplin's Chili with him. Apparently, he was able to secure exclusive rights to use the word chili as well, with Hank and the gang over at Levinson's being left with the name Chaplin Soups and Subs and the word chowder. Eating, Looks like yes. chili. Uh, You're not allowed no, to say chili? Tastes a lot like chili. This shocking twist, of course, left everyone on set stunned and some disappointed. It's too bad. You shouldn't have any opinion on that. You shouldn't be positive or negative about their company. But Chaplin's Soups and Subs was still able to serve up chowder and stew dogs, and Hank insisted that their food tasted pretty good if you like it. it. Tastes very good if you like it. Anyway, in seriousness, if you've seen the special, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm actually referring to, but I'm gonna come back to that. The sheer depth of comedy Tim and Greg are able to achieve at this point in this universe is jaw-dropping. The fourth annual really benefits from being the Oscar special that aired during what I would consider to be comedically the greatest run in the show's long history. And actually, dare I say, potentially the greatest comedic run in the history of anything that I'm aware of. It all amounts to this really sad saga of midlife restlessness and confusion, of failure and ambition and embarrassment. It's the story of a man who has no idea who he is, stumbling along from persona to persona, trying to find himself to the absolute detriment of everyone around him. Of his rivalry with another, who rather unfortunately is exactly who he is, and static to a fault, and to the detriment of himself. An undercooked but charismatic cult leader locking horns with an energy vampire with anti-charisma powers on a level the world has never seen. The whole fourth Oscar special is effectively a very silly, three-hour squabbling, bickering, playground argument between these two troubled and attention-seeking children. But it's more than that, too. Because of the surrounding circumstances, there's a thick layer of real personal darkness introduced that seeps into every frame and shapes every part of it and makes it a really interesting piece of this massive puzzle. This ridiculous show is happening two months after the death of Tim's infant son. The psychology of these characters and how they're moving on is as interesting as it is disturbing. It recontextualizes everything going on here. Knowing his son just died, Tim's speech right at the top of the show is appalling. I'm having so much fun. I gotta tell you, I'm, I've never been healthier. I've never been stronger, I've never been happier. Or even smaller stuff, like when Tim makes this weird joke about his wife spending too much of his money. Show me the money. Me That's the why money. I say that almost every Show day when I'm talking to my wife. Yeah. This hits so differently when you remember she's a grieving mother who lost her son two months ago. Essentially at the hands of a man who, in an exceedingly positive light, is featured on the very same show this joke is being made on. I mean, imagine being her watching this show from backstage and seeing your husband take weird jokey digs at you and speak about the man responsible for the very, very recent death of your child like this. I can see you becoming a good president. My friend, and my uh, guru, Dr. San. Don't Dr. Worry. San is my mm -hmm. god. We trust you. Do I trust anybody more than you? 
He is the man. He's Dr. Sand. Let's hear it for Dr. Sand. This is such a living, breathing world at this point that any little moment has so many layers to it if you're paying attention. Just pep up! Okay. A lot of what makes it work so well and makes it so funny are how it plays with what came before. Honestly, watching through this one, it was harder than the first three for me to select which clips and random little jokes and funny moments to include in this video because there are just so, so many. Greg, get some soup in you. So much gold, albeit gold that isn't exactly new in concept when compared to the first three, but I can't stress enough this repetition isn't a bad thing. When you watch anything, really, you generally want something new and surprising, and On Cinema always delivers on that front. But at the same time, when you go to see a Tom Cruise movie, you want to see him run. When you go to see a Brad Pitt movie, you want to see him eating stuff the whole time. When you go to see a Leonardo DiCaprio movie, you want to see him raise a glass for a toast. Thank you, uh, Leo, for acting as good as you do. In the same way, when you sit down to watch an Oscar special, you want to see Greg doing something lame and embarrassing that's loosely related to movies, and Tim losing his mind in anger about it. Look in the camera and say what the hell's going on. Everyone's confused. To Explain to the audience that's patiently watching this, wondering what the hell's going on. It's a tribute to all the Bond movies. Well, to then all say that. 35 Bond say movies. Say that. Well, you, don't need to you want to see Mark trying his hardest to impersonate random old Hollywood characters and becoming visibly deflated and slipping out of character to recite facts. You want to buy a horse? I get you a horse. You want a van? I get you a van. You want a car? I get you a car. My name is Chico Marx. I, uh... I was the oldest of the Marx Brothers. A lot of the DNA of an Oscar special is stuff that's almost funnier because you're expecting it knowing these characters so well. Tim sincerely apologizing at the beginning and promising that he would not be drinking and would never behave the way he did last year again is immediately funny to those following along because beginning on this note leaves so much room for the drastic fall from civility that we all obviously know is coming. <laughs> He clearly becomes drunk and enraged as he literally always does, resulting in some of the meanest, most abusive behavior of all time. If this is all you do with your life, uh, congratulations. If this is the be best night of your life, that's pretty sad. It's, it's a all phenomenal somebody thing has to that do is say, we don't have him. We don't fucking have him. Where are you going? Where are you going, Mark? Get the fuck out of here! You get out! I'm done with you! I saw that fucking tape of you, Mark! You fucking asshole! This time around, there's perhaps more context for his anger. For example, we know Tim broke Mark's nose before his performance as the Marx Brothers because he currently hates him for having played Decker in Greg's hypothetical finale of the prematurely canceled Decker vs. Dracula. But me, I'll jab you back, trust me hard. Ask Mark what you do when you cross me. But his behavior is ultimately similar to the previous years in a lot of ways. I've seen this rap. before, you know? Mashing things up, then going home. <laughs> But Tim Heidecker and Greg Turkington rarely rest on their laurels and are always finding ways to breathe new life into the concept without retreading the same ground where it counts. However, it's a tricky line because the illusion of this universe's reality is upheld by playing along with the idea that these characters are releasing this content, and not that a real-life comedian is its architect. So it needs that repetition. These characters are stuck in their ways with their opinions and obsessions and creative limitations. From this comes those evergreen jokes, like the increasingly limited capacity in which the actual Oscars are discussed each year on these specials. We're not going to get into the minutiae of who's gonna win every single award. And a lot of the movies that came out this year were garbage. A lot of movies people don't even get to see. That's mm. what Oscar looks at. They've traditionally always bowed down to the box office numbers. You can have white Oscars, you can have black Oscars, you can have Mexican Oscars, Chinese Oscars. The uh, best supporting actress is Alicia Vicklanker from The Danish Girl. No one saw oh. it. Hey, congratulations to Inga uh, Alberto in the rock. Alberto, the relevant director, made big, uh, directed the Oscar, uh, directed Best Picture tonight of Relevant. So congratulations to that boy. But again, this was two months after Tim's son passed away. Here they are doing the same bullshit and finding new variations on it that are really funny, but even beyond that, it says so much. A popcorn popping contest between fans of mid-level Marvel movies was always going to be trivial and stupid. Under the circumstances, my god. The nuance of this universe kind of organically deepens as it moves and we learn more, while the static elements, these immortal running jokes, ground it all. Because the very fact that they're still doing the same bullshit as always is funny in itself, and even funnier depending on what's being played against it at any given time. But these Characters do change. Well, I guess Greg is the one that never really changes. I mean, he kind of does. I have theories on that idea, but surely the basic dynamic Greg remains completely static while Tim constantly changes personas and opinions. We've seen him become obsessed with alternative medicine. We've seen him become a motorcycle guy and quickly denounce motorcycles entirely. People should drive cars a lot safer and stick with cars. We've seen him become so enamored with the political appeal of his Decker character, and now he's definitively in rocker mode. Who I really am, I've been searching for him my whole life, and I've found him. I've found, I've found him. At this point, his rock band Dakar seems to be the only thing he actually cares about anymore. It's my number one passion in life. He's still singing Oscar Fever, but with a fresh coat of ridiculous pain. I got the Oscar Fever, hope you got it, 
His entire way of speaking changes in a split second when he's on stage with the band in such an obvious crisis of identity. It is time for Empty Bottle! We already heard the Empty music. Bottle. Watch it, watch it, watch what's coming. What's coming down the well is not what anybody wants. I think it's why these phases he goes through are so funny. It's always so surface level. Like he's cosplaying as the type of character he thinks is cool, but lacks awareness to how embarrassing that is. I love how even as Tim reinvents himself, he still always has the same tricks up his sleeve, but ports his new personality onto them like a new unlockable skin for his style of live show hosting. Like last year, he promised Mike Huckabee would be joining him in the studio and ended up drunkenly cursing his name when he didn't show. And this year, while still promising another Republican politician's involvement, we're gonna get a live call in from Dr. Ben Carson. He decides he's a rock star now and that everything should be filtered through that persona. Therefore, naturally, he spins up a story about meeting Johnny Depp at a club in Hollywood and convincing him to drop by the Oscar special. I know this isn't the intention, but it makes me laugh to think that Tim actually met and was fooled by the Johnny Depp impersonator that Tim and Eric used in their movie and Nathan Fielder used in his hilarious souvenir shop scheme. That aside, it brings me back to what I was saying about how as all of this grows, the comedy doesn't get stale, it only deepens and new layers of irony are introduced. Tim and Greg are visionaries that are so meticulously aware of their own legacy and canon. They have an incredible way of combining or juxtaposing jokes that few other creators can match. If Tim came out and played lame music and made a fool out of himself, sure, it's a funny moment, but instead it intertwines with the other elements it plays so beautifully. This is one of the most unique skills that Tim and Greg have that's allowed this concept to endure for so long. The honestly pretty impressive, albeit colossally stupid, Oscar medley is a good example, because beside the amazing element that his lyrics out him as knowing nothing about these movies beyond their titles, I believe there's a Martian sitting on top of the world. It's amazing that Tim in Dakar mode is still weirdly attached to paying tribute to Billy Crystal. The idea of a cool fringe rocker guy with such reverence towards Billy Crystal's Oscar legacy is such a hilariously specific note. These combinations create such unique comedy because how else could that joke be made if not a part of a continually evolving comedic mosaic? It's one thing to come up with a successful comedic idea in isolation, but to combine many of them organically while enriching each element is something almost no one else can do so well. Oh, hey, hey. Again, it's that big inside joke element that makes continued viewing so uniquely rewarding. But this special is a treasure trove of layering continuity. A Dakar music video that's mostly footage from Decker, including a literal reuse of another music video scene. Tim calling out Mark for portraying the Marx Brothers too closely to W.C. Fields. Hey Anything. everybody, I'm Groucho Marx. Is that like uh, W.C. Fields. Doing W.C. Fields, snap. Come on, I asked you to get ready for this and prepare for it. An ongoing segment that manages to combine Fant Stick, Ant-Man, VFA coding, pop popcorn, inclusion of the fandom, Lord of the Rings, and the tradition of bringing insert random show or movie here heads into the Oscar special studio. And remember, this is all two months after Tim's infant child has passed away. With all the current controversy going on with Dakar, it's really interesting to look back at their first performance together. It's crazy to think back now how elaborate the saga of this band has been over the years. At this point, Axiom was a minor side character and Manuel hadn't even really been properly introduced. In this universe, you never know what seemingly unimportant characters that are introduced will become important figures. D. Thompson, the inspirational Christian author that Tim brings on the show in this special returns one more time in an even more limited role, and that's pretty much it. By the way, How I Went to the Oscars Without a Ticket is a real book. You can find it on Amazon, and the comments of the listing made me laugh pretty hard. How the hell do they find these people? The D. Thompson thing isn't the strongest segment of all of them for me, but some really funny stuff does come out of it, like when it turns into a weird racial dialogue. What is your perspective on this whole oh, black <laughs> issue with the Oscars? I'm colorblind, so I don't even know. I just want to say I'm also colorblind. Or when their conversation becomes complete chaos with Greg droning on about oh god and Tim completely in his own agitated world. But the point is, anything can happen on cinema. Mark being introduced on the second Oscar special could have been a funny one-off gag. And look how far his character and story has developed over the years. Watching this back just reminded me of what a journey this has all been. Because at the time, you might think Axiom and Manuel especially would end up glorified extras for Tim to play music with and for Greg to complain about. But I mean, my god, all these years later, Manuel has donated his butt skin to Tim's face. Axiom's donated his right hand. There have been breakups and reunions and betrayals and car crashes and comas, many iterations of the band, a reality TV pilot, so much more. And now a coup is unfolding before our very eyes and the story of these characters is far from over. It just goes to show the care taken in building out this hilarious multi-year story of this weird band, throughout which Empty Bottle is still pretty much their only song. Speaking of which, the opening of this special is one of the funniest to me, simply because Tim's new Dakar arrangement of Oscar fever just morphs into Empty Bottle at a certain point, because of course it does. <laughs> The 
the way this show recycles its music to illustrate Tim's absolutely feeble imagination is so brilliant. Empty Bottle is the best example because it's constantly reused and reprised throughout the show. Like an empty bottle, dreamed of everything left in my mind. It's pretty much the one original song Tim has a claim to creating in his entire history with Dakar. And during the trial, we found out that he didn't even write that. But the song is shoehorned into everything and milked for everything it's worth, which at face value is not a lot, but comedically, it's a fountain that never stops giving. Actually, it's exactly how I feel about Dakar in general as it pertains to this universe, and particularly this Oscar special, because the band is a massive presence here. Almost 25 minutes of this is dedicated to Dakar performances. A whole lot more is dedicated to Tim patting himself on the back for them. What great lyrics, right? I mean, just to be able to go, ah, yeah, Mad Max, giving all ladies heart attacks. Perfect. It's not hard, but you won't, you it's won't like, be why isn't anybody else doing it? And of course, Greg Riley criticizing it all and protesting. On cinema, on songwriters. It has and nothing to do with cinema. Oh, right. Shut up. Why don't you have like an Emmy show? Because if it's, the whole thing is about this music, and you're making this Oscar studio a, a target for terrorists of people that don't like bad music. Two hours of your rageaholism no, and alcoholism and horrible music. It might be the best showcase of Greg Turkington's attitude towards Dakar, because he's uninterested in humoring Tim even a little and complains at every chance he gets. One of my favorite running jokes in On Cinema is how much Greg hates music. Music is not movies, and that's the problem right there. Greg is out. His unnecessary rejection of music in favor of movies plays so perfectly into his feud with Tim, especially when Tim is hell-bent on playing as much music as possible, often seeming almost specifically intended to spite Greg. The Constant Dakar performances and Greg's constant arguing is an example of how their feud is more overtly represented in this special than ever. Greg's yearly Dolby theater visit is incredibly, against all odds, way, 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 way worse than even his previous three, as most of it has no sound and consists mostly of poorly shot footage of a bathroom. But even this disastrous segment ends up in a direct swipe at Tim. Those Fantastic Four movies are garbage. That was a snipe job. It was a snipe job. Tim's segment on how Peter Jackson had no idea what he was doing when he was making the Hobbit movies is a deliberate, pointed attack on Greg that's unforgivably crushing to him. What'd you think of that? Seems like that guy's got a lot of figuring out. There's no reason to do that. Joe? The viewers Jackson's of the show head, are huh? Hobbit people. Why, why you would do something like that, I don't know. When Greg is doing his seminal James Bond segment, he continues to pretend to shoot Tim with a gun many, many times. There would be no on cinema without this strange and petty rivalry between Tim and Greg, and this Oscar special is one of the most contentious ever. In others, it mostly simmers under the surface and boils over at points, but it's completely inescapable in the fourth. I think a lot of it's because, at this point, everyone involved is in a place of such turmoil and uncertainty. Not only is Tim recovering from the tragic loss of his son to months earlier, but Greg is facing his first Oscar special in a year with no Hobbit movie. A little bit of a Hobbit hangover. You really feel the pain and tension in the air in this one, and it builds naturally to a point of all-out chaos. But like I said, this feud is right there on the surface, being very literally and elaborately represented in three main ways. The first, and I suppose least significant of the three, is all the Twitter polls that Tim and Greg are constantly setting up to prove each other wrong. Do we have any results on how many people love Dakar? I bet you won't give the results when they come in, because I bet they won't be very positive. What did you think of Dakar? Uh, covering that play it again 60% look at that that's fantastic nobody likes to car We're I'm gonna about do that. my own polling because I don't no, trust don't, your polling. nobody wants this is a great bit and it cleverly involves the in-universe audience that is really us in the real world being invited to play along with the joke as we always are the idea that everyone in the fandom is a part of this thing and gets to participate and pretend all of this is real is yet another reason why on cinema is so fun and rewarding these Twitter polls are a direct line to us gathering Tim heads and Greg heads to have fun arguing while being cleverly weaved into the story I really love when they do this kind of thing. It also brings up how these live shows incorporate the nameless, faceless crew into the story as well, because someone's behind the scenes putting up these polls and controlling their visibility. Can we not show Greg's on the big screen? You cut Greg's out. I had another one. Well, do I'm you gonna like talk to the director uh, for a second. I don't want you using Greg's up on the screen. Not. You don't touch Greg's. His it's stupid the same. Polls don't it's work. The, the director has a large presence here. Someone behind the scenes taking abuse from Tim and ironically punctuating the action with overlays and technical issues, and even at one point can be heard laughing at Tim. I'm gonna go take a shit. Obviously unintentional, but somehow still works when you consider the director to be a normal person in this universe being dragged along in this nonsense that we can relate to. It has to be mentioned that the director, Eric Naturnicola, has his own huge creative stamp on these productions by orchestrating these elements in real time, and his work shouldn't be left out of the praise. The second way their feud is personified here is even more on the nose. The first thing you may notice about the set this year is that it's the same set from last year, except instead of a Star Trek and an Oh God poster, there's an Ant-Man poster and a Fant Four Stick poster. I should've done this a long time ago! This ties into the ongoing Oscar Olympics segment that weaves through the whole thing. After the last Oscar special's reveal of Greg's involvement in Ant-Man, Tim went and got a role in the movie Fant Four Stick. Oh, 
This has become an important running argument between the two, with Tim saying that Ant-Man is bad. A horrible, horrible movie, Ant-Man. And Greg accusing Tim of paying his way into a vanity role in Fant 4 Stick. I wanted to ask you, if you pay $15,000 to be in a movie and they cut the scenes out, do you get a partial refund? Of course, their iconic Star Trek argument being used as a key point in Tim's murder trial defense is the far better payoff to a similar idea of petty argument spitting out into something bigger. But I do love the idea of personifying it in a dumb competition here. The inclusion of Tim's foreheads and Greg's ant heads as the teams is a great idea. How much did you pay to be in the Fantastic Four team? But I actually do have some issues with its execution. I've always been particularly thrown off by this woman saying this. Can I Robert? Well, saying Greg, that. who's you, a hero of mine. I've always thought of the heads that they bring into the studio as unattached random people that they've hired to make themselves look important. I love how Greg always cites his fans and that people love him and are reaching out to him and supporting his positions against Tim with no evidence. And I've always liked the idea that he could be just lying about all of it. Because after all, why would there be any genuine reverence instead of ironic enjoyment of what these people do? That's just a brief nitpick in the grand scheme of things, really. If I'm too universally positive about everything with On Cinema, the truth is I'm just far more interested in celebrating its brilliance and less in nitpicky criticism. What's the point of that? But there you go. There's a tiny nitpick for you negativity heads out there. The Oscar Olympic stuff also serves as the post-Hobbit continuation of the write-in candidacy joke that I've loved so much on the previous three. Who's gonna get the write-in vote? It's gonna be either, you think it's gonna be Ant-Man. It's Ant-Man or Decker versus Dracula. I think it's gonna be between Fan 4 and Decker Hawaii. I and don't think The Revenant is going to be able to compete with I something don't think like so. that. And it's always so fun to see how certain jokes evolve into others based on the current state of the universe. Beyond that, there's just some really funny content that comes out of these Oscar Olympic segments. On the note of these brilliant combined jokes, the incorporation of these pathetic claims to fame that Greg has, such as his coding system. They didn't even finish the code. There's only six digits on this. That's not good or the fact that he seemingly literally only eats popcorn, and these points causing these sub-arguments with Tim touches on so many of their long-standing gripes with each other all at once. The added element of Joe so kindly and cluelessly trying to hold it all together is worth a lot of laughs, too. Oh, we won! One to nothing for the ant! No, okay. Whoop, and a sandwich thrown in there. Okay. You get this sausage on your back here. I mean, who doesn't love Joe Estevez? But as these segments go on, Tim kind of stops caring about the competition and begins to appeal to the audience's tolerance for this, criticizing the concept as a whole. We're losing audience people here. I don't want this. Oh, you By the way, Greg, nobody wants to see people popping pop. Uh, it's gonna take four hours to get through this. Now, there's been a lot of controversy surrounding my channel, with people in the comments accusing me of being a Greg head. While I'm generally partial to film expertise over rageaholism and terrible music, I would consider myself a fair and non-biased journalist. In line with that, I must say that Tim is absolutely right on this one. These segments are absolutely misguided on the part of in-universe Greg. I do think they're funny though for what they represent in Tim and Greg's relationship and the back and forth they lead to. It's better than Dakar. Again, they bring together so many inside jokey elements and create something really weird and singular. Awkward people loosely dressed like Ant-Man characters competing to correctly label VHS tapes based off of a film buff's proprietary coding system is certainly not something I could imagine happening anywhere else. Also, this is happening two months after Tim's infant son passed away. <clears throat> I've said it before, but the reality is there's consistently pieces of this show that challenge you or even kind of grate on you. But it's in service of this really confident kind of comedy where making something inherently entertaining isn't exactly the point, but rather the comedic value of its existence as it relates to this world and these characters. It's what makes on cinema hard for a lot of people to get into, but so endlessly rewarding for those who take the time to really dig in and understand what's going on and what it's saying. Finally, my favorite of the ways in which Tim and Greg settled their differences live on air is the continuation of my absolute favorite joke from last year's special. Whether or not James Dean faked his death by lying very still in order to do regional theater in the Midwest for 60 years is somehow a massive point of contention in this universe. And thank God for that, because in in spectacular fashion, the ending of this special brings together Greg's history of bad Oscar finales, Tim's anger issues, everyone's relationship with Dr. San, again this is two months after Tim's son died under his care, and this wildly original James Dean storyline that I feel like only Greg Turkington could ever possibly come up with. All these elements are so rich on their own and amount to something even greater than the sum of its parts. Throughout this special, this idea that Greg sourced one of James Dean's pubic hairs, I presume, from a museum in order for Dr. San to perform a DNA test is teased out. The more you think about each element involved in this being a thing, the more absurd it is. The living painting sponsored by Chaplin's Soups and Subs is such a misguided and lame idea too. Though it's a real improvement on Greg's previous Oscar special finales. Let me just say it is the biggest spectacular finale 
in on cinema Oscar special history. Well, your competition is not very strong because last year I believe we had a, the, the fraud James well, no. so-called Dean, and we the year before was the that is the James stupid, Dean. Shut up. The stupid uh, domino crap. The uh, that was the amazing. You just shot Oscar. wrong. I love how Tim's reaction to its reveal goes from genuine confusion to outright anger as he tries to derail the whole thing. Is this your thing? Is this your whole thing? I feel bad for those people. That's about it. Boy. I'm sorry, everybody. Can we move the painting out of the way? Because then it doesn't look like the thing. I'm sorry about this, gang. Let's just enjoy it. What are we to, to enjoy? What are we to enjoy with this? Because it sucks. When Dr. Sand reveals that the DNA test concluded as a match, it raises so many questions for me that I've never quite been sure on. Is Dr. Sand just trolling Tim? I would doubt he could actually perform a DNA test, and who knows what he's even doing in this weird lab. But are we to believe in the reality of this world this is actually James Dean? I don't think that's the case. It doesn't seem like a line they would cross in this universe. So did Greg simply get a hair from this guy's head, submit it for the test? Dr. Sand's got a lot of talk, a lot of answering. I gotta talk to you about some stuff. I'm not sure. I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on this. But the truth is it doesn't matter, because the aftermath of the reveal is incredible. I mean, just look at this bizarre group of people. Dale from the Baskin Robbins scene in Ant-Man, a discredited alternative healer, an awkward chowder peddler, two Italian musicians, a battered comedian dressed as Indiana Jones, and Martin Sheen's brother in a referee costume happily clapping as an eccentric old man in a James Dean costume claiming to actually be James Dean replaces an actor who apparently has been rehearsing for weeks to stand by a table for a bit in a live recreation of Chris Consani's legal action painting. By the way, this is two months after the tragic passing of an infant. Add to that Tim raging out like the Hulk and disrespecting the whole thing, and you get, again, such a specific and bizarre note. It's just kind of glorious. Oh, uh, just because you're James Dean doesn't mean I'm going to beat your ass. I have to say again, this guy that they found to play the James Dean character is just so great in this role. It leaves me so in awe of their eye for casting. I still can't get over the way he matches Tim's insane energy, and once again seems like he's ready to fight this guy that's like 40 years younger than him while throwing playground insults back in his face. I'm out of here. Good night. This sucks. Oh, good. Now we can all have a party. And weirdly, one of my favorite parts is how pleased he is with himself in the midst of all this chaos. Well, that was the end of the special, but not quite the end of this video, because I still haven't addressed my absolute favorite part that I would consider the real climax of this three-hour masterclass in experimental comedy. I want to bring out my, our son, Tom Cruise Jr. Thank you, Father. It's so great to be here with you and Mom again. It's actually a contender for my favorite part of any of the Oscar specials. It's a moment not only in the show's history, but in the history of comedy that I find to be somewhat unmatched. I can't think of anything this daringly fucked up and wrong on a personal level, this sad and weird, this off-putting, that's simultaneously so silly and ridiculous and so laugh-out-loud hilarious. It's a towering achievement in dark, absurdist, hallucinatory comedy, and it goes back to what I was saying about how expertly layered and sophisticated the jokes in this universe were then beginning to truly be. This isn't just some silly goof for shock value. A moment like this is incredibly, exceedingly rare in comedy. And there's a reason for that. It can only possibly work when earned by visionaries that are taking their universe as seriously as Tim Heidecker and Greg Turkington do. I know there are probably those out there that would doubt the idea that these are genius level comedians, but the fact that they pulled this off and made it this damn funny is all the proof you should need of their vision and talent. Because how could they possibly make this funny, or even palatable at all? A child dying is not funny. Let's get that out of the way. It's an unimaginably tragic thing, obviously. What is unbelievably funny is the way it's handled in the surrounding events. Tim has always floated from one thing to another, not caring what happened happens to anyone else. So it's a really rich playground to bring him into this situation in which he's dealing with a horrific personal loss, the worst thing that can happen, and watch him be flippant. It's been, it's been six weeks, what's that song? Do? Disinterested. He's a diet. Coke. And use it to his own personal gain. Oh, the silver lining of his passing was a little bit of cat, you know, a little, like, a lot of bit of cash, a lot of, a lot of money. He seems to have some awareness of how inappropriate his behavior is. He's, I feel like I'm gonna catch hell for this. Tim even says it's been six months or so since it happened. It's been six months or so since we lost the little TCJR. When, as I've been saying this whole time, in reality, it's been two months. He literally tries to pretend that it happened longer ago than it did, either suggesting that it isn't important enough to him to know how long ago it happened, or that he's deliberately trying to make his behavior seem less callous and inappropriate. But what he does is so mind-numbingly inappropriate and outright gross. When I first saw this, I kind of couldn't believe they were going for it. I've had a great life. You two are the best parents. I grew up to be healthy, handsome, and successful as an actor and model. Even after having the confidence to make a whole season of On Cinema about such a horrible tragedy, for them to go on to create a segment where Tim talks to a 3D model of his dead son that's all grown up, warning everyone of the dangers of vaccination is kind of shocking. If I could give one message to the world from my grave, it would be, don't vaccinate. 
It's so dangerous and deadly. Even more shocking are the details of this. How the rendered model's clothes keep randomly disappearing, the unsettling way the model's mouth moves, Tim's performative emotion, Ayaka's amazing performance in reacting to all of it. And maybe more shocking that every moment of this is somehow hysterically funny. When you realize it's just Tim's own pre-recorded voice pitched up talking about how great he is, it clearly represents how Tim's feeling about the tragedy. You know, it's a bittersweet sort of thing. It's literally all about him. It was never about Ayaka or Tom Cruise or anyone else. It's been reduced to a cheap stunt in which Tim praises himself using his late son as a non-consenting mouthpiece. You have been such an influential role model for me. I love you. You're the best dad. But nothing is in isolation at this point. As Tim's suspicious life insurance payout is revealed and Decker and Dr. San and Mark and Dakar are all folded back into this horrific display. Because after all, Decker and Dakar are Tim's real babies, the only ones he ever really cared about. His thirst for fame and attention was the only reason he became a part of his son's life in the first place. And you get the sense here that he wouldn't have it any other way, that it all worked out for the best for him. We have taken the passing of my son. We have turned lemonade. We have taken lemons and turned it into lemonade. Tim's performance here is amazing. He's some poisonous mixture of manic and excited and triumphant and deeply angry about his petty issues with those around him. I want everybody in this four. fucking room, everybody say it out loud. Let's make Decker great again. Let's, uh, make, Let's Decker make Decker, make great, Decker again. great again. Yeah. Let's make Decker great again. To see someone act like this so soon after such a tragedy, it almost shouldn't be funny, but it's beyond hilarious. Then, when you watch the next season of Decker and it has a noticeably higher production budget, the knowledge that it was paid for by Tom Cruise Jr.'s death underpins the whole thing. A show that would soon feature an episode in which Tim's character would abandon his son in a reprise of the series that Tim was filming as his real son was dying instead of staying home to take care of him. Goodbye, son. Forever. Goodbye, Dad. Goodbye forever. A son played by an actor that has now taken his place in the band that once drew his attention away from his real son. See what I mean about these layers, people? The 3D Tom Cruise Jr. model, <laughs> that sentence is just ridiculous, is one of those milestone moments and the type of thing that's only possible this far into such a well-realized world, and then needed to be pulled off live on air. This could so easily be a disaster, but with the live direction of Eric Naturnicola even re-adding the overlay after the fact at the perfect moments, and with this amazing performance and layering world building, it's my pick for the highlight of this special and one of my favorite and most remembered moments in a much broader sense as well. Anyways, if you couldn't tell, I think this Oscar special is good and I like it a lot. Do I think it's the best Oscar special? I know a lot of people do, but no, there's actually a winner in my mind, and we haven't gotten there yet. Guess write in the comments and win a $50 gift card to Caraba's Italian Grill. Wherever it ranks, and it's up there for me, the fourth annual is hilarious. It's unique. It's the kind of achievement most comedians couldn't hope to create in their entire careers. And it's only a tiny fraction of what On Cinema has to offer. See you at Greg Turkington's Our Cinema Oscar special. Good night! <laughs>